This is the League of Women Voters of Winnebago County Candidates Forum for the Wisconsin State Assembly District 56. In case you don't know what District 56 is, I had a whole sheet of all the places that it encompasses. It's part of Appleton, all of Winnick County, Butemore, Dale, and Winchester, as well as the town of Dale, oh, I'm sorry, the towns of Dale, Grand Chute, Greenville, Poygan, Vinland, Winchester, Winnick County, and Wolf River. Then we have the school districts within the district's boundaries, which include Appleton, Freedom, Hortonville, Nina, New London, Amro, Oshkosh, Wyawiga, Fremont, and Winnick County. That is a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I'm Peggy. And, Could you um, repeat that for me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Peggy, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, Carol was just instructing both of the candidates um, the timing for tonight's forum. Your opening statement <clears throat> will be three minutes. The audience questions are two minutes, and the closing statements are two minutes. Mr. Murphy is going to start. And Diana Lawrence will be able to give her uh, closing statement at the end first. So, um, I drifted just for a second. Okay. <laughs> How long is the opening statement? Like, you get up to three okay. minutes if you need right that much. Okay. So, um, let's begin. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Representative Dave Murphy. And I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank the League of Women, Women Voters for uh, sponsoring this event. I'd like to thank the uh, Village of Winnicani and the library for letting us use their facility tonight uh, so that we can have a lively discussion. Uh, as a youngster, I grew up on a small dairy farm in the town of Grand Chute. Um, I like to say that I learned, I learned my work ethic from milking cows and baling hay. Uh, I always remember at the age of 12, um, my mom asked me to go help the neighbors bale hay. There was an older couple that lived up the road and didn't have any children uh, to help them, and so she sent me up there to help them. So uh, that afternoon, I went up there and baled hay for six hours. When I got done, the lady said, oh, before you go, I have something for you. And she ran in, and she came up with her. She had a... a, a sugar bowl. She kept her money in the sugar bowl. And she pulled two dollars out and gave me the two dollars for bailing hay for six hours. Of course, I went home and, and uh, I got home and I'm, I'm waving my two dollars around. And my mom said, where'd you get that from? I said, well, it's what the neighbors gave me for bailing hay. Said, you take that back. She said, we don't take money from neighbors for helping them out. And so that was the, sort of the ethic that I, I grew up with. Actually, at age 14, um, and my, my brother Jerry is here tonight, he'll remember part of this. Um, at the time, he was in the service in Colorado. My parents went for a week to visit him in Colorado and left me to handle the dairy farm. That was a small dairy farm. We had 25 cows, but cows had to be milked every night and every morning. All the animals had to be fed. And this is a responsibility of a 14-year-old. Um, I think nowadays that probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't happen, but you know, back in the day, my parents felt that I was responsible enough to do that. So. But my mom liked to use sayings to teach her four boys, um, you know, the, the ways of life. It was a, you know, a stitch in time saves nine, or it was many hands make light work. Um, Jerry could probably add a few more to that, maybe many more to that. But you know, the many hands make light work made me think a lot about what's happening in the state of Wisconsin right now. With the amount of jobs and the opportunity that's out there right now, we have so many more people working and so many more people pulling our state in the right direction. And those jobs and those opportunities and everybody working together is what's making Wisconsin move in the right direction. It was interesting to me recently that there was a TV report. And that TV report 
the, the two reporters that were talking with each other, with you, with each other were talking about the report that last month Walmart had record sales. But not just record sales, they had record store traffic. So I asked myself, in this day of millennials using the internet for purchasing, and let's face it, we know the rich aren't spending their time in Walmart. What is this telling us about our economy? What it's telling me is those people in the middle class, in the lower middle class, and the working poor are the ones that this economy has helped the most and has, has really um, moved their economic uh, situation up. And uh, I, I think it's one of the most satisfying things about what's been going on in this economy to see the working people of the state of Wisconsin really start to see some benefits from um, what we've done over the last eight years. So thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to some great questions and some great discussion. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to meet with voters and demonstrate that my opponent and I have different philosophies for the state and for our district. I appreciate the League of Women Voters for organizing this event and to you for joining us. I am Diana Lawrence. I grew up in Appleton in a family of seven children. My parents were working class, but we somehow had what we needed. My young adult life, however, had its challenges, which ultimately left me as a single parent. At times it was a very painful existence, but it taught me much about acceptance of the things I cannot change and about how to fight for the things I can change and not to give up. I got political when I married Alan and joined Sierra Club. The club's main mission is to get people out into the environment so they will want to protect it. And part of fulfilling that mission is to get politically involved. I've participated in Madison with several conservation lobby days with the League of Conservation Voters. I was also a volunteer citizen lobbyist in Washington, D.C. to represent wilderness in southern Utah. I've gone to public hearings and written letters about pending legislation. And I've participated in numerous citizen rallies to encourage our representatives to be better representatives. Along the way, I realized, like many of you have, that my state government is not serving the needs of our citizens. During this campaign, I've realized that many people are unhappy with government. People, when I go to their doors, people often tell me, and this is verbatim, politicians are all crooks. They feel their vote doesn't really matter. And they may feel there is a little difference between the actual candidates. Some of these people have dropped out of politics completely and have given up their right and responsibility of voting for the candidate that they feel would best serve them. I'm here to say there is a difference between candidates and the parties they represent. We are not alike. And your votes really matter. Society is impoverished when its citizens don't participate and engage with politics. I entered this arena with the idea of helping with environmental protection and social issues that I cared about. But I have come to realize that my primary issue needs to be restoring confidence in the democratic process to our citizens. I will work to represent you and to enhance your ability to participate in democracy. Before you are, before you are two candidates with different ideas, our incumbent has obvious advantages in knowing facts and details about current legislation that he has been involved with for six years. But he was no better prepared to enter office six years ago than I am now. Thank you. Okay, the first question goes to Diana. Oh, yeah. And this is a question about child care. Affordable, high quality child care is a critical contributor to the community's economy. Yet in our area and statewide, there is a critical shortage of <coughs> child care staff. 
Administrators struggle to hire educated and, and experienced teachers. Centers are closing rooms at a time while parents struggle to find child care openings. And child care teachers cannot afford to stay in a field paying an average of $10 per hour. What will you do to address this critical shortage of child care staff in a time of record low unemployment rate? Very good question. Well, I think that probably goes right to the heart of uh, our minimum wage laws. Um, I am in favor of a higher minimum wage. So eventually, to get to $15 an hour would be great. Um, I, I mean, there could be other ways of doing it with tax subsidies, but I, I think having a better minimum wage, and that would, hurt, that would help everybody uh, across the board, and not just child care workers. And I think if you could, people would come into that, this career uh, and stay if there was a better, better wage. I mean, I just think that's obvious. And I think one way to get there would be to have a $15 minimum wage. I think this does not call for cookie cutter answers because this is a situation where there are people out there who want um, a certain level of, uh, of child care. They, they, want, they want certain things. There are other people that maybe don't. And I think to have um, a variety of different choices available to people is very important. Um, I think so many times we look at this as just bang, this is what we're going to have. Um, so I think going forward, um, there is a market for, for child care services. And I think uh, we have to look at how much we value those services and then how much are we, people willing to pay for that. Um, definitely, if we want people in the workforce, we need to find ways, though, for um, people on the lower end of the economic spectrum to be able to have um, child care services available to them so that they can, um, they can be adding to the workforce. Because we need the workers out there, and so that's extremely important that we get them into the workforce. Okay, this question is for Dave. Prominent economists have laid out the wisdom of funding early childhood initiatives, citing the return on investment ranging from $8 to $17 for every dollar spent. Investing in young children results in greater school success and graduation rates, lower rates of incarceration for youth, decrease in special education expenditures, lower teen pregnancy, decrease divorce rates, and higher employment rates with higher wages. What will you do to promote wiser and more effective investment in our human infrastructure, our children? As a um, council member with the um, Family Impact Seminars um, at the University of Wisconsin, we have looked at this issue very extensively. And we have looked at, uh, we, we had a seminar um, within the last two years on early brain development in uh, children. And we've looked at that issue. Um, and I think <coughs> this is extremely important. I think the ability to get out in front of problems with, uh, with children is, is definitely important. Um, and we have, we have made uh, improvements in those areas uh, to be able to, to intervene and to get to those kids more quickly. And I, I just think that that's, that's what we need to do, and we will continue to do more of that. Diana? My daughter actually needed some early intervention when she was quite young, uh, before even kindergarten. And I was always very appreciative that that was available to her, because I think it probably did um, it may, who knows what effect it had in her life, but so I was very grateful for that. And I think this is something the two of us agree on. Um, <laughs> I, I couldn't have said it better, so I do I'll have to say I agree with Dave totally on this one. Okay. So, Diana, this is a question on gun violence. One of the defining characteristics of the upcoming Generation Z 
is that they have been shaped by constant news of school shooting and gun violence in many other public places which is negatively affecting their sense of safety and well-being. The vast majority of Wisconsinites, including gun owners, are in favor of common sense measures such as comprehensive background checks for firearm purchases. Will you support legislation to enact, back, enact background checks for all firearm purchases in Wisconsin? Yes, I would. Uh, I would any Anything we can do to increase, uh, without making it ridiculous, um, background checks, I'm, I'm in favor for. Um, I think the, having a more amount of time between buying it and, and getting it and using it is, is only a good thing. I'm totally, totally um, okay with the Second Amendment and people's right to bear arms and all that stuff. Um, but I, I do... And it is a sticky problem, I mean, because people do have the right to, to have the guns. And I do think we need to do more reaching out. I would personally like to speak with more gun owners to see what, what things they would have in their mind about what could be made better. And, but I, I think having police in school with weapons and teachers with, with guns and is just... Um, it's not helping the situation with the students, making them more stressed out, um, having those people walking around. And so I, I am totally, to answer the question, I'm totally in favor of um, more background checks. Okay. It's kind of interesting, when, when the uh, school shooting came up in Florida, um, we were kind of looking at what kind of things should Wisconsin do to make sure that this doesn't happen here. Um, I personally went back and research school shootings in Wisconsin as far back as I could find. And the, the, the farthest back I could find a school shooting was in 1873. Um, and that was a particular situation where the uh, father actually shot the teacher because uh, she disciplined his child. But uh, interestingly, there's never been a multiple uh, school shooting in Wisconsin. Um, and actually, of the school shootings that we've had in Wisconsin, most of them have actually been adults, not children. So, and another uh, kind of a common thread, um, there was a fair number of shootings that happened actually after school uh, that involved like um, fights after basketball games and that sort of thing. Not, not actually the kind of thing that we've seen in, in other states where somebody's coming into the school during the school day and, and, and shooting someone. Uh, it's always difficult. We're dealing with a, constitu a constitutional right uh, to bear arms in the Second Amendment, and I take that very seriously. And um, when I'm looking at um, any type of restriction on that, I always ask myself, um, am I really solving a problem? Is it helping? And in so many cases, when I look at what's happened in, a, in, in some of the shootings, um, what we're doing is not, would not have solved that problem. And I also look at it, we also have First Amendment rights, the rights of free speech. Um, would you allow somebody to restrict that right? Would you allow somebody to say, oh, you need to get a permit to, to exercise your free speech rights, for instance? So, thank you very much. <clears throat> so I would like to go back to that question. Um, would your answer be yes or no? Because that's what the question. Will you support legislation to enact background checks for all firearm purchases in Wisconsin? I, at this time, I would not. I, I, if a bill would come forward, I always will take the opportunity to look at that. And I really enjoy the, um, the opportunity to get to see things in committee hearing because um, as a legislator, that's where I learn the most um, when I started hearing testimony in committee. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is for you, Dave. Um, climate change. What are your thoughts on climate change? Is it a concern for Wisconsin? And if so, what are some proposals that are being arranged or brought up in the legislature as solutions at the state level in Wisconsin? 
Uh, absolutely, it's a concern. Um, I think if you are a, a person that is um, a, re a responsible person, I mean, you're going to take the time, you want to look at it, you want to know that you're making the right decisions on things. Um, I, I would have to say that when people tell me that it's settled science, I think that's ridiculous. Um, I think there is very little settled science anywhere. Uh, I think people like Albert Einstein probably roll over in his grave if, if uh, you told them that things like this were settled science because people of science proving their theories is very important to them. And Albert Einstein, for instance, went through a tremendous amount of work to, to, to try to prove his theories. And I think at the end of the day, his theories were accepted but I don't think he would ever say they were settled science. So um, I see the, the um, private sector and the marketplace dealing with the, the issues of climate change, and I see the, the market dealing with um, people's concerns about it. I mean, the more concerned that the public is about it, the more business steps up and says, we are going to supply electric cars, we're going to supply um, better and cheaper solar panels. We're going to, you know, and so it, it goes right down the line. So um, I have no particular legislation in which, you know, I'm looking at, at bringing forward. But again, um, always uh, look forward to, to seeing what might be out there. Diana? I, I do believe in climate change, um, and I do believe it's people have something to do with it. I mean, there's natural variations as well, but I, I think we've had a good hand in um, the amount of degree change we've already purchased. Um, and I do think that we need to start thinking about how to mitigate some of what's coming toward us. It's To me, it's like a train, and we're standing there, and we have to figure out how to get off the track. Um, and so I, one of the things, I mean, he's right, the market provides what people are asked for, and people are asking for more energy efficient items, more solar panels, things like that. And I think, you know, government could also do a part in that by offering um, tax incentives to buy these, some of these things. Um, but yet climate change is real, and I think the state should really start looking at uh, what its role is going to be in helping to mitigate and and help people along a path that we're going to be on as this gets worse. Um, like Miami. Miami is doing some interesting things. They're, they have flooding issues all over the place because the water is rising on them. And they're building their streets and their roads and their streets higher. But that's only going to last a certain amount of time. So those are the sorts of things we have to look at. What can we do as a state? to help the people because um, it is climate change is here and it's, it's um, going to be doing more damage to us. Thank you. Diana, this is uh, along the same line. Uh, how can we best transition to a clean energy economy? And then, uh, referring back to some things that Dave said, should science-based information be restored to the DNR website? How can we make sure everybody, including legislators, have the information they need to identify best practices for addressing climate change? I guess I'll answer the second part first. Um, yes, the climate information should be brought back, and it's just generally scientific information should be out there on the DNR website, especially if they've done their research for it. Um, if they're doing research for it, um, we're paying for it. We should know what they've actually done. What was the first question? Um, how can we best transition to clean energy economy? Well, I, I think uh, tax, so tax incentives, tax credits, we need to look at maybe some of those things. Um, one thing I have thought of in the past, kind of twirl it around in my head, is when new construction is being built, um, is there a way, and I, and I don't know, is there a way to have people put more energy efficient 
um, building blocks to their to their home and their businesses when these are brand new. Because to retrofit when something's been in place for 40, 30, 40, 50 years, it's very expensive. Um, so I mean, that's one thing I just twirl around in my head, uh, options like that. Was there a third? No. Okay, thank you. Okay. Would you like me to reread it? No, oh, I think okay. I'm fine. Um, I think transitioning to a more fuel efficient economy is something that um, everybody's trying to do all the time. I talk with businesses, they're trying to, to become more efficient, especially here in the Fox Valley, a lot of our industry is paper industry. And I'll tell you, one of their number one uh, issues is the cost of energy. I mean, that's a big part of the cost of, of their manufacturing. So they're trying to get their energy costs down as much as they can. Now, obviously, um, a homeowner can stick a solar panel on top of his house, and that might add some supp supplemental um, energy. Maybe it'll supply it all. I don't know. But businesses, businesses have a different, a different problem. They run 24 hours a day. The sun doesn't shine at night. Uh, Paper, uh, paper mills don't, uh, aren't built on top of hills, they're built on the river, and so, uh, you know, uh, windmills generally aren't uh, something that, that they can deal with. So those businesses need consistent forms of energy that's out there all the time. So I think going forward, technology is going to be huge. Our ability to store energy is probably our biggest issue when we look at at other forms of energy because we can we can generate these these other forms of energy but that energy may not be where we need it and it might be not at the time that we need it so we have to be able to store it now people will say well technology will take care of that well it, it will at some point but uh, it's not as if we can just snap our fingers and say that that's just going to automatically be taken care of. Uh, somebody's got to figure that out, and it's going to take time, and you can't, you can't always force these things to be done at the rate in which you would like them to be done. Okay. Dave, this is a question on transportation. Hmm. For baby boomers and for people with disabilities, public transportation is essential to maintaining an active lifestyle and accessing medical and other services. For millennials and for those who do not own cars, it is a lifeline to jobs, services, and entertainment. 36% of our bus fleet is past its useful life and needs replacing. The Wisconsin Transportation Finance and Policy Commissioner's Keep Wisconsin Moving Report recommends a $36.3 million increase for public transit and transportation funding to the state budget. The question is, what is your stance on increasing funding to recommend levels for Wisconsin's public transportation needs? And will you prioritize fixing local roads over new highway expansion? Holy smokers, that was a long question. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll try to take it off in, in some bite-sized pieces. Um, um, we have our, our uh, village administrator, uh, Mitch, here tonight, and, uh, uh, you know, I know this is near and dear to his heart, and, and, and we've had some discussions on it, and we have increased funding for local road aids, but because of the formula, that doesn't always mean that everyone is getting an increase, and here in Winnet County, they are not. And I think with uh, the with the the new bridge going in, and and, and some of the uh, side roads getting uh, you know extra usage and stuff, um, we're going to have to look very very seriously at how we uh, deal with a village like Winnet County and try to get them back um, back on the right track as far as uh, taking care of those local roads. So that's very important. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know. Uh, Mass transportation for different people. We're talking about the millennials. Uh, somehow, there's an idea out there that uh, millennials don't drive cars, um, and that's not really true. Um, one thing I found out about millennials is they're not exactly what we thought they were, and that is, the millennials are different because they came of age during a very bad recession. 
So what happened was, all of a sudden they didn't, they, 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 they turned uh, 20 years old during a recession, they maybe didn't have a job, so they didn't buy a car right away. And we somehow thought that now they are completely different from other generations who are not going to buy cars. Well, as soon as they got jobs and they started making money, guess what? Millennials started buying cars. And um, I think transportation going forward because of technology is going to be tremendously different. Uh, I think the whole driverless car phenomenon is going to make a tremendous difference in how transportation looks going forward. I mean, we're going to have the ability to um, pick up elderly folks and get them to where they need without putting them on a bus. I think we're actually going to be able to service our people better with, uh, with some other uh, technology than we, are with, uh, than we are with buses. And, and that, that's not to say that the bus is going to go away, but um, it's going to be different. I think there's no question. Just the question part. Yeah. What is your stance on increasing funding to recommended levels for Wisconsin's public transportation needs? That was the first one. And the second is, will you prioritize fixing local roads over new highway expansion? As far as the bus transportation goes, or trans public transportation in general, I suppose, uh, but particularly buses, will always, in my mind, will always be needed. There's always going to be that segment of the population that needs that type of service. And even though they may not be riding the bus, even though sometimes you look at the bus as it goes by and there's nobody on it, that same bus going by, you know, at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. is full of people. So I, I really do think we need to um, do whatever we need to, to properly fund the, at least the bus system. And as far as the, the roads, um, I do, f generally speaking, favor um, waiting on new construction on roads until we can fix what we do have, especially in certain parts of the state where they're in dire, dire need of new roads. Um, there's always going to be that exception, and I understand that. So I, I hold that open that there's always going to be the exception that maybe a new piece of road needs to go in to alleviate um, a major problem. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Diana, this is a question on health care. What do you think of how the Wisconsin legislature has approached health care costs and availability of health services? What is your plan to address health care costs and access to services? And the third question is, what is your position on eliminating problems, I'm sorry, protection for people with pre-existing conditions? Health care is one of those really, really big topics. And part of it is at the federal level, well, with the Affordable Care Act. and. I personally would like to see something on, 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 in Wisconsin at, at that kind of a arrangement so that everyone can have at least a, a basic buy-in of a basic plan. <coughs> and not to necessarily to replace all the private plans out there, but I think we need just a basic core plan that, that anyone, and, and make it affordable that people can buy. Um, what was it? What was that? Oh, the next question is, what is your plan to address health care costs and access to services? And then the third is, what is your position on eliminating protection for people with pre-existing ah, conditions? Okay. Yes, the pre-existing conditions. Um, I guess the pre-existing conditions um, comes in with that, um, that plan that everyone could choose from, that base plan, that obviously wouldn't have any pre-existing condition limitation on it. Um, and I just, I just really feel strongly that we can't have a pre-existing limitation out there. Thanks. So in the last session of the uh, legislature, the assembly passed a bill for um, covering pre-existing conditions in Wisconsin. I was co-sponsor of that legislation, uh, and I'm very proud to do so. Um, when we look at um, 
health insurance, so the, the costs are too high. Um, and I think we need to do things to, to contain costs. Uh, the governor came up with a plan this last year for a reinsurance program um, where premiums had gone up by double digits in the past. Um, premiums next year are anticipated to be down and maybe by as much as 10%. And that would be a tremendous uh, improvement in that situation. But I think um, the, the reason that we passed a pre-existing uh, uh, conditions bill in the assembly was our, antition, our anticipation that Obamacare would be repealed. And I would be for the repeal of Obamacare. Um, and I think the only part of Obamacare that really has any merit was the pre-existing conditions. So we passed a bill to take care of that portion of it. If the rest of it would go away, I think we would actually be able to lower health cares because I think the extreme amount of regulations involved with Obamacare uh, is, you know, was causing uh, rates to rise at such a rapid rate. And so, I mean, that, that's really part of the problem. Um, because of some of the things that were done in Washington um, to take away the indivi individual mandate of Obamacare and some of those other things, it's, it's helping. Um, but I still think that uh, a repeal would have been uh, the, better, uh, the better situation. I am on the health committee, and I would like to see uh, that health care come back to the state of Wisconsin, because I think we could do a better job with it than what they can do in Washington. And I think... I'm very much a believer in the idea that there are 50 laboratories of democracy out there in the 50 states. And I believe that the more states that are out there working on this on their own, um, the more good ideas we would come up with. Okay. Dave, this is a question on school vouchers. Wisconsin voters do not know the cost of the private school voucher program. Will you take the lead and have the full cost of vouchers included on the property tax bills like public schools and technical colleges are currently listed? Well, when, when you talk about tax bills, we've all seen our tax bill, comes in a little card. Everybody does it that way. There are so many lines available on that card and there are really very limited space on there, really the way that we do it right now, to put extra things on there. Um, so, um, you yeah, I, I don't know what we might take off in, uh, off in our, tax, our tax bills to, to fit something else on there, but uh, uh, I, I would certainly be willing to look at the idea. Um, and again, uh, it's, it's the local the local units of government that are putting that out, so uh, we would have to see how that how that affected how that affected them. Diana, I'm all for transparency, and I think something like that should really be on your tax bill. Um, and if I, I get that there's only so much space on it, but um, <coughs> it needs to be redesigned, um, and that does have some expense in it, and um, but yeah, I'm, I'm all for finding a way to make that information um, more readily available. Okay, this is another question on vouchers. 23 times the issue, I'll start over. 23 times the issue of vouchers has been put before voters in the country, and 20 times it has failed. If elected, will you bring the public school funds being diverted for private school vouchers before the voters of Wisconsin. Who's that? I think Diana. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, so if I'm understanding that, like a referendum. Well, it says, if elected, will you bring the public school funds being diverted for private school vouchers before the voters of Wisconsin? That could be in a form of a referendum. referendum. Um, hmm. I guess, I don't know. I'd have to really think about that one. Um, I don't know, honestly. I don't have an answer for you right now. I have to think about it. Okay. Dave? I think it's already been done. And so there are communities and counties that have referendums, and we get those all the time. 
but there's been a referendum in that we've had elections for the assembly, the senate, and the governor over and over again, and um, so far um, we've we've put people back in office that have supported school vouchers, and so uh, I feel confident that uh, that the public feels that we are doing the right thing. Okay, this is uh, reducing childhood poverty. Children are among the most vulnerable people in Wisconsin. One in six of them live in poverty, and this number has increased significantly in the past years. Racial disparities in child poverty rates mean that children of color face an even steeper climb for equity. Will you support legislation that would commit Wisconsin to a three-part goal of cutting child poverty in half, cutting racial disparities in poverty in half, and establishing a mechanism to reliably, regularly, and publicly measure our progress. My first? Yes, you are. All, your goal, all the goals there are very laudable. I don't know if cutting them in half is is um, a reasonable uh, or attainable goal uh, in the near future. Um, anytime I do something like this, I want to be able to look at it and say, I have a chance of getting there within X amount of time. If you set a goal and it's not reachable, then it becomes, you know, it just becomes unimportant. And so I, I would rather see, um, I think a little bit about, for instance, a couple years ago, um, the, uh, a group came in to me and said, we need to cut the prison population in half in, in, in two years. Well, that's not a reasonable goal. I mean, you'd certainly love to be able to cut the prison population down. I don't like having to pay for, for people uh, in prison. But again, the goal isn't reasonable. It, it is, it's... It, you can't sometimes do these things that quickly. Um, the other thing I would say is, and you talked about disparity in our state, and I, I just, I don't understand. We have had, our biggest problem is, our, is, is in our biggest city, uh, uh, the city of Milwaukee. The city of Milwaukee has had either Democratic or Socialist um, mayors for over a hundred years. And this is what's giving us, you know, the, the disparity. I mean, the people in, in, this, in those socialist cities are having trouble pulling themselves out of poverty. And where we have opportunity, that's where people are, are getting ahead. Okay. Diana? Uh, I guess I, I part, partially agree with Dave on this, in that um, to put a number on it, um, exactly like half I mean it is a, a goal to shoot for um, but over what period of time I mean can you actually get get that done it's worth it it's worth starting it's worth doing um, and you need to have benchmarks uh, but to to have it go in, in a just a year or two or three is probably not realistic um, ten years oh sorry did I I heard it wrong no I don't think we had included it, but it was meant to be over a 10-year period. Oh, and 10 it years. it has been done in Great Britain. Oh, 10 years. Okay, 10 years. I'm, I'm probably good with that, actually. Uh, I, I think if you really put the effort into it, um, you you could some, make, make some really big impacts with it over a 10-year period. That's a long time. Okay, this is a question about redistricting, Diana. What are your thoughts about Wisconsin's current redistricting plan, where the majority party determines the Assembly, Senate, and Congressional boundaries? How would you work to bring about a fair redistricting system in Wisconsin? Here's probably where I divert a little bit from my Democratic colleagues and, and, and people, is that um, a lot of a lot of Democrats want to say, well, we can't have either Republicans or Democrats doing it because they'll they'll both 
when given the opportunity, they will take too much. And I really believe that we still need to have both Republicans, we need to have bipartisan look at this thing, plus other people to keep a, a check. On. So taking it away from one party generally, doing it by themselves and, and having a bipartisan um, with a, a third party, maybe citizens or some other people in there will, I hope, keep everybody on the up and up. And I think that's really important to, to do it that way. Thank you. Well, one party doesn't necessarily do it. They may, but that's not the way the system is set up. Many times during redistricting, we've had two parties. Uh, the two parties uh, have have joint control of the government. When that happens, then then they do have to uh, come to an agreement on what that redistricting map is going to look like. On the other hand, uh, when the voters have put one party in control, then then it, it has been their purview to do that. Uh, some people have brought up uh, Iowa as a model in which we would want to emulate. Um, I say that uh, a third grader could redistrict Iowa. The state is, is a, is a uh, rectangle. If you drew, if you went like this, you could make four congressional districts in Iowa without too much trouble. The largest city is Des Moines, it's about 200,000 people, that's all the bigger it is. There is, no disparate, there is no difference between the population going north and south or east and west. It's all about the same. I mean, this is the simplest place in the world to redistrict, and it's used as the example of why we, you know, uh, of, of going to that type of redistricting process. Uh, I don't see it. Um, and I, some people will say that politicians are picking their voters. Well. When I ran for this seat, I got redistricted out of the 56th Assembly District. So I can tell you right now, I didn't pick my voters. Okay. Just a question for Dave. The 56th Assembly District encompasses many rural communities. What unique challenges do the rural communities face, and how can the Wisconsin Legislature address them? Good question. And I think um, when you look at our rural communities, um, we were just talking earlier about uh, issues for, for Winnicani and their streets and their budgets, and um, uh, our shared revenues have to do with uh, uh, how much growth is happening, and so it, 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 it is very challenging. And um, it, it may take um, a, a look at, at how we do our levy limits. Uh, I'm not for getting rid of the levy, limit, levy limits, <laughs> But um, I do think the formula could be looked at, and there could be some added criteria put into that formula to, to make sure that certain, uh, certain rural communities uh, fare uh, better under that. Um, we've done a lot of work in the last year on rural schools and rural school districts. And I think that has been one of the keys, and I pushed very hard for that, um, and we were able to get um, extra extra aids for rural schools. We were able to get extra aid for transportation for those schools. Um, and so I, I, I feel really good about that. And I think it's something that we need to continue. But one of the things that's happened is, interestingly, the economy and the, and the job market has really picked up pretty well in some of the rural communities. Um, in the past, there was always an issue of you know, the urban centers, um, their economy is improving, but, but the rural community is not coming along quite, quite so well. This economy has been pretty good for rural areas and for small, small towns, and I think that's, that's something that is um, you know, very heartening to me. Uh, there are, as we all know, um, some issues in, in rural areas, um, schools, and Dave gave a good example of that. Um, they also have problems with health care providers, and we need to figure out a way to get um, more doctors and keep hospitals and business out in the rural areas so that they don't have so far to go. Um, how that would look, I, I don't know. Um, possibly... Do you give incentives to providers to, you know, like, 
give them some, knock off some of their student loan debt or something like that to get out into a rural area, I don't know, something like that. Um, and another issue that rural areas have been struggling with is the internet. And I think the internet is a real good equalizer. Um, it brings the world to your fingertips, literally to your key keyboard. And I think the, at one point in this country, we electrify the rural areas. If, if we can do that, that long ago, we can for sure get internet out to the rural areas now well, with relatively, um, maybe it you know, has expense to it, but I, I think it'll really improve the lives of those people in rural areas. Thanks. Okay. Diana, Wisconsin has a much higher incarceration rate than our neighboring state of Minnesota. How can we better address helping those who are in prison with root causes of addiction to drugs or mental illness? Sure. Wisconsin has a much higher incarceration rate than our neighboring state of Minnesota. How can we better address helping those who are in prison with root causes of addiction to drugs or mental illness? Well, they need to get the treatment at some point. Um, just they need to get the treatment, whether they're in prison or before they get there. You know, when they're in the um, the, the, the moving towards prison stage. Um, I guess that's my answer is just we need to get them the treatment to to get get over that addiction. And um, you know, people who are in there for let's say. Marijuana possession. Are, are we going to decide that we don't that that's not a thing people should be going to prison for? I, I guess we have to decide that as a society too, and that should be something we talk about. Okay, Steve. First, nobody goes to prison for marijuana possession. That just does not happen. I, and if I know that that's out there, but it's not correct. If you go back, if, if there is anybody who's, who, who shows up as being in prison because of marijuana possession, if you go pull their file and look at it, they're that thick and there's lots of stuff going on. And the only reason that they're in prison for marijuana possession is because the district attorney dropped every other charge against them. So, I mean, that, that, that just doesn't happen. As far as what we're doing is we started a job training program for inmates um, in their last year in prison. And we had a group of female in, uh, inmates recently, I think it was this, like 60 of them, that completed that job training before they got out of prison. We placed 100% of those gals in jobs. And I thought that that was really a tremendous success. And it goes back to, um, we have an issue in Wisconsin with having enough workers to get the job done. And if you can look to all different sources, this is one of those, you know, uh, every, you know, going to every place possible to find more workers. You attract them, you, you uh, train people in prison, you, we have put, we have 10 times more handicapped people working than we did eight years ago. And that's because we've trained uh, those handicapped uh, citizens and got them into work. We have more than 300% increase in um, apprenticeships in the state of Wisconsin. And um, that one is very near and dear to my heart because uh, I'm a member of the Workforce Development Committee and I worked hard on the apprenticeship program. And we came out with some different um, uh, funding sources um, to help, for instance, poor kids that want to go into the trades. One of the biggest impediments for young kids getting into the trades is you have to have your own tools. Those tools are expensive and they can cost uh, thousands of dollars. We're actually giving them grants now for that. Okay, um, that was the last question. So Diana, if you would like to give us your closing remarks. Sure. 
So thank you again for being here tonight. I appreciate your time and attention. You have heard two distinctly different opinions on some issues. Remember that for six years our incumbent had had this office and failed to help our state with many challenges facing us. My primary issue is restoring confidence in the democratic process to our citizens. I will work to represent you and to enhance your ability to participate in democracy. So what do I stand for? I stand for clean, open government responsive to its citizens. I will serve our assembly district and the state of Wisconsin by respecting the opinions and values of all of our citizens, regardless of political persuasion. We all pay taxes to support our government and it needs to work for all of us. Although I may support legislation that you wouldn't support, I will not do it to support a partisan agenda. I will respect your opinions, wants, and needs while weighing the needs of the current generation and future generations. I will work to eliminate gerrymandered district borders, and I will make it easier for you to vote. I will have frequent public meetings around our district so you can tell me your wants and needs. I will represent you and help you from getting left behind. We work too hard earning the money that pays taxes to demand anything less. The late Senator Paul Wellstone from Minnesota said, Politics is about doing good for people. That's what I intend to do if elected to represent the 56th Assembly District. In her 1998, 1988 speech to the Democratic National Convention, Ann Richards had a great statement about that election, and I think it still applies today. When it comes down to it, this election is a contest between those who are satisfied with what they have and those who know we can do better. I would appreciate your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight and uh, you're a great audience. I talked about growing up on that small dairy farm and generally life was good. But it wasn't always good. When I was four years old, our 18-year-old hired band decided that I needed to know more about sex. I can tell you I didn't. When I was 15, I won an audition to be in the Hortonville High School musical. It was very important to me. Um, I was cast in the in a lead role in Finian's Rainbow. You might call it typecasting for a young Irish boy, but um, I was very excited about it. However, I lived on a dairy farm 10 miles from my school. My father worked off the farm, and my mom didn't have a driver's license. And there was no way that I was getting to all the practices for that musical. So I wasn't able to do it. That's why opportunities are so important to me. When I first started campaigning for this job, I created on getting Wisconsin going in the right direction and getting our fiscal house in order and our budget balanced. We did that. The next time I ran, we created it. We, I, I ran on creating jobs. And we created jobs, and a lot of them. Last time I ran, we talked about increasing people's wages. <coughs> and we were able to do that also. When my opponent talks about people not trusting politicians, I'm here to say tonight that I have told the voters of this district what I'm going to do, and I've gone out there and I've worked hard to try to get it done. And I am proud, very proud, of the job that I've done. You know, eight years ago, two states came to a fork in the road. One of those states was Wisconsin, and the other state was Illinois. Illinois decided that they were going to increase taxes that there were increased regulations, Wisconsin had a different idea. 
We knew that the only way that we could get out of the budget crisis we were in was to cut spending and to cut taxes. And that's what we did. And you can make a decision for yourself who you think went down the right road. Well, let's thank our candidates for coming.